Okay, welcome everybody. I, I think we'll just get going. We've just started a little bit late, but hopefully you will um, forgive us. Uh, my, my name is Gavin Wade. I am artist curator here at Eastside Projects. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a white man with, as I've mentioned before, a perfectly bald head and black glasses and a black top. And I'm behind me are frames and books on the wall of Eastside Projects Past Endeavours. Um, and it is, uh, and also there is, if you need the um, closed captions button, there is, it's working at the moment, the live transcript is on with the CC button at the bottom of your screens. Um, it is great pleasure today to be hanging out with Rajni Pereira over in Toronto in her, in her studio. Um, and I will ask Rajni to introduce herself also. You want to go for it, Rajni? Hello, I'm Rajni. I'm here in Toronto. Uh, it's also known as Toronto, and I make my work on the lands, the shared lands of these 14 nations, the Mushke Gowak, the Mohawk, the Tuscarora, the Seneca, the Cayuga, the Oneida, Onanaga, Haudenosaunee, Delaware, Mississauga, Chippewa, Potawatami, Algonquin, Odawa, and Anishinaabe. And Toronto sits on the shared land of all of these First Nations. Wow, that is. A oh, and I'm a brown. I'm a brown woman with, uh, with lots of hair, <laughs> lots of black hair. And I'm sitting in my studio. My technician is also here, and we're working on various things for the installation at East Side uh, that we're going to be installing starting from May 16th. So I, I love this, um, the explanation of the land and all of the, the people. We have to do it here talk. now. Yeah. yeah. Because I've, I've in Canada, what is the, we are culturally, people who work in culture are trying to do is start these land acknowledgements. Yeah. Unfortunately, as far as the government, Canadian government goes, which is a British colony, this is a British colony, yeah. uh, there is still very little action being done to do any reparations towards the uh, first custodians of this land. Oh, really? I, yes. yeah, I didn't know. Because I, I imagined, I've seen it so many times now that I thought it was a fully adopted kind of government you know? institutional. No. We are just trying to do our part, but yeah. the, you know, Canada, which is now just a conglomeration of various mining corporations, that's where they mine. They mine the lands of these people. Yeah, yeah. Well, We've I mean, it's we'll do the work. We're going to stop it. Yeah, it's a really, in a way, that's a very unexpected but great intro to part of the context of why we've been in a position to invite Rajni here to make an exhibition with us. Although, in a way, that's just an excuse because Rajni is such an amazing artist who would have wanted to invite you no matter what was going on is the, is the absolute truth. But, um, but I think to make it, to find the relevance is that we on the occasion of the 22nd Commonwealth Games that will be happening here in Birmingham, um, we wanted to make sure that we could invite artists who we think are really asking questions about what that means for a country or a city, particularly one like um, England and Great Britain and the United Kingdom and its history of colonizing um, and the relationship of making something like a Commonwealth Games which if within its naming and within its history uh, perpetuates um, uh, the old empire or the, or you might, some might say the current empire that still sits there around the world. So I think that was a really interesting um, example of lands far away from where we are here that are still needing to be reparations made and dealt with the reality of what's happening there. And I think that Rajni, Rajni's work, your, your work is really also dealing with that by looking forward at the same time as dealing with, with histories. So it'd be, it'd be really great to, to unravel some of that and find out more. And we, we, will, we are doing a bit of a proper catch-up studio visit also, even though you should know that much of the, almost, well, all of the work is in transit at the moment as we speak from Canada coming over to Birmingham. So we're not gonna get to see it all in the flesh, unfortunately, apart from a few little a little leftovers, perhaps, and other elements that- yeah, But I do, have, I do have photos for you. Yes, 
And there's photos that I haven't seen yet also. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some of these parts that we've been imagining and even writing about. And, um, but yeah, so um, we're gonna, so we're gonna talk about uh, Rajni's show, which is called Traveller. And it's part of an ongoing body of work. And I guess that's where we're starting and wanted to see um, useful to talk about how long that that project has been happening for now um, and where else in the world has, has been taking place. Yeah, so Traveler is a, it started from one painting that I made in, in 2017. Um, I saw this really beautiful, both photographs and, and these kind of older paintings of, of uh, Mongolian soldiers. And they seem to be like, they were very ornately dressed and very beautifully armored with horses and flags. And I was like, you know, they really look like they're looking for something. Whether or not they were in battle, there was something very wandering about these beings that were being depicted. And it made me think of, it really struck me as being like in the spirit of where I come from and where billions of people have come from. And looking at that, but it was also, you know, put together very majestically and painted very elaborately. So I was just like, you know, let me do one. I'm going to do one for the show called Mother World Creates and Destroys Itself. And it was my first exhibition with currently my art dealer here in Toronto. And that's Patel Brown Art Gallery. And, um, you know, I really liked that piece. And then I started to paint more of them and more and more, and they were just these kinds of very elaborately painted busts, kind of like a likeness of someone who's historical, who has a historical um, significance, uh, but we don't know any of these people. And then as I, I was painting them and painting them, I, st I started thinking about mutation and mutating their faces and bodies a little bit more. And then I started thinking about immigration and mutation together as a un, as an inevitable sort of confluence of realities. So, and that can be everything from physiological mm -hmm. to cultural, sociocultural, spiritual and religious things coming together and changing from a place of not really knowing where to be. In some cases, not knowing where we, come from really and still searching for identity and doing all that stuff I don't really want to make like identity based work I know that my work is identity based but I want to have it be more about a foresight and more about a speculative futurism yeah. than it is about you know particularly only identity mm -hmm. so that's where I hope that answers the question about where traveler comes from yeah. and like it's now it is a quite a large series of many paintings, the best of which will be, has been secured and will be shown at East Side. Uh, and then also now Pollution Wear and using the creation of this series as a ac exercise in uh, world building um, by, by liberating or by br manifesting these forms into, three, into sculptural. So I started making functional pollution wear and gas masks that are very, you know, I spent a long time sewing them and, and um, decorating them into something that my peoples will wear one day. And you can, most of them are fully functional dust and particulates, um, fumes masks, you can just put it on. The other ones you can attach the canister to an oxygen canister and go through a landscape that's very hard for you to live, hard for you to live in. Yes, you've got these two, these two massive kind of not, not unconnected themes that what one that you, when you were over here last year, you, you, you used this phrase a number of times that it, that the work was set after the end of white suprematism. Yes. And so that, and that, that's like this one moment that there can be a cut off and a change in how the world is working and how yes. it understands the future by acknowledging its past in a way. And then the other bit that you're just referring to there is that idea of ecological collapse. And of course, the two are totally related. Completely so, related. 
Yeah, so I think fact, that you mentioned it as a moment, Gavin, but I think this is something that's a long. It's been happening and it's gonna continue. But right now, if we even look, turn on the news or go on our computer, you can see that that white supremacy and the Eurocentric world and its demands are actually imploding completely. And yeah. that's what is resulting in uh, civil unrest worldwide um, and things falling apart. Yeah. I, empire, empire related ideology, late capitalistic ideology is falling in on itself. People are very angry because they have to live through it and they can't, quite frankly. Yeah. So, so, you know, I mean, empire I don't responses. quite agree that it's a moment. I think it's a, I mean, if we were talking about time earlier and like, you know, how people will describe, everyone has a different version of that. I don't think it's this, but I think it's like, it's like that and yeah. then in about, I don't know, but it, yeah, I don't know when it will end, but in regards to it, in regards to the timeline of my work taking place after it, it's something, I think it's more about how immigrated populations are then the victors of a very harsh world that's been left behind sheer because of the sheer fact of having to survive through through the downfall of world human world 1.0 to yeah. go to the next one it's very hard we at the end we're very different we look different we're changed maybe if we maybe if those people breathe the oxygen we have today they won't feel so good they've been breathing particulates and and um uh, refuse for too long and they don't feel well at the top of a mountain or something if the air is too clean they don't feel well yeah. so these are the kinds of things that I try to address inside the mythology of traveler yeah. in funny strange ways you know and you have this this phrase that I was reading that you I don't know if you, if you coined this or if you've you've borrowed it from somewhere else about immigrant futures yeah immigrant futures Oh, I totally ripped it off. Some I'm just kidding. I I don't know. Yeah, As I think it's a kind of sci-fi. It has a sci-fi feel to it, but it's also obviously very grounded and looks it's like very it's grounded. Fun. You know what? I think I was looking for. Uh, my work was really tied to people were tying it to Afrofuturism. Okay. Because I paint brown people and black people in the work. So then they were just like, oh, Afrofuturist work. I'm not even not a fan of the term Afrofuturism because it was coined by a white scholar in Berkeley. So I don't really, you know, on that word, like there are better words for exactly that term, such as Astro Blackness. Um, yes. But, uh, but I, I wanted to talk about immigrant futures and I wanted to make that really, really clear. It's like, this is, it's not about a race of people. It's about everyone other than the white race of people. Right, because we are the we are the folks who've had to we've had to mingle and mix and evolve and adapt in very different ways from a result of not having privilege. Yeah, and that's yeah. That, that's why in this in the future, no, we don't know how far away it is in the you know in the future. But you 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 build it. Your world building is based on that idea of the diaspora and of yeah, the, the ma but maintaining cultures and building on that idea of the diaspora. Yeah, I mean, as a diasporic person, I can tell you that my culture itself and the culture of, say, the Sri Lankans and Ethiopians around me and Indians and Filipino people, like, uh, our culture is all, it's cha it changes, too. It changes, too, right? Absolutely. The, the nature of diaspora is that it has to change by necessity. It keeps changing joyfully sometimes, resiliently, and it's yeah. not always about some strife. Yeah. Uh, can also be a joyous life. That's also something I want to reflect through the series and be particular about. It's not, it's yeah, not absolutely. something that's about hardship. It's about yeah. resilience and victorious, uh, resilience yeah, and a victorious. I think that's what struck me the first time I saw images of your work, how, how much power the individuals held, but not in yeah. a, not in a kind of, you know, exploiting somebody else power, but just in a power 
to to be you know to yeah, live agency. Just, just yeah. agency yeah I just found it yeah I came out you know I went to art school here and uh, me and very handful of other color artists of color making identity-based work and and I was hit you know I was I realized I was looking at a lot of trauma trauma porn work which you know there was a whole you know I think a decade of you know work about strife and moving because of strife and sadness and hardship and thing and thing and then of course what happens with institutions is that they like hook into that same thing right and they're just like you know every time we're going to show an artist of color it's going to be about how hard it is and it's just like I don't it's not always hard you know what I mean like it's very different and yes it's you know there is a lot of hardship in being diasporic and colored in inside a white nation but it's just or white controlled nation but it's just like don't deny it please don't deny our our joy and our victory and uh opulence you know don't deny that we can't deny that to ourselves we come from that we made that yeah yeah and i I mean i always it's sort of interesting just listening to how you talk about that as well and that that you feel that in the work you know you and the work speak in, in you, you're, you're in sync. So that's always, it's a mate, it's very, in, it's got this integrity to it, I suppose. Yeah, so, cause it's real. I'm not, honestly, I'm not a bookish artist. Like I don't research, I don't do all this research. I just make my work from lived experience. So yeah. I think that really helps it to sit together. I'm not having to, oh, let me pull up, you know, a, a visual culture reference. I don't, you know, yeah. I, I did that at school, like I'm done. And I know that it doesn't help <laughs> work to be accessible to everybody. I really want my work to, you know, everyone to understand. I want yeah. my daughter to like it and I want my mom to like it. Yeah, but it, I think it makes, yeah, be, be, let, let, let's show some images because I think that's part of the, the feeling is like when you're looking at the works, you, you can enjoy the elements and the combinations and the way things come together and the, and the power and sort of majesty of the portraits within the landscapes and it yeah. is this, yeah there's just this this sense of but you but I still always I want to know like oh where's that where's that bangle come from and how is that headdress worn and which which is which is the lineage of these materials and and that yeah. always like it's not that you you know you don't list them you don't just you don't give all the answers but it feels exciting to to ask questions and to be watching something that can be in the future in that way. Yeah, um, I am needing Are you to, able to, sh- to share. Yeah, I know. I'm. I, it looks like I'm needing to approve something in my system to let Zoom share uh, the screen, which I don't. If you'll just give me like one minute here. Do yeah, you know what this is? Yeah. Uh, is it uh, full? I think it might be existing. Oh, sorry, unlock it, my bad. Okay. Does that work? Um, I'm getting there, just a second. Yeah. Very much- Cracks uh, the system. Un- hmm. Unexpected. Okay, here we go. Oh, no, you gotta click it. Click sorry. it, thank you so much. I've just got the best of the best, you know, in here. <laughs> okay, now share. Oh, it won't do it. How strange. Oh. Just a sec. Just uh, isn't. So that. Oh, I have to quit. And Once reopen. You restart it. I have to restart the application, the whole application. Oh, Can, what, no. what do you suggest that we do? Well. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Should we? Um, Can we start again? Oh, we're gonna lose people. No, you, no, you yeah, everyone can't start again. No, you you could, but then we might lose you, and that would be that wouldn't be very good. I can I can be let back in, right? Yeah. In, in okay, theory, I'm just gonna yes. do it. Yeah. <laughs> this is a very this is a very bold move. <laughs> We've just lost our artist. <laughs> okay, we will count count down and see. Otherwise, I, I'll just have to open up this publication next to me and, and show you some pages of it, which was going to be my backup then. 
What's that? Oh, I'm a. <laughs> I wondered what that meant then, Jazz. Yes, I, but I do. I do have it here. I'm not. I'm not joking. I've got this whole thing, so we can just look through the book and have a nice chat and see where we get to. <laughs> and then after that, I'll ask Matt to come on. <laughs> <laughs> which that that was just a little bit of a forewarning Matt. we might ask you to do that in a little bit later anyway <laughs> but Raj, Rajni was saying that you wouldn't be down in your basement with the fungi because oh man a very good connection down there yeah you're back yeah, I'm back I'm back hi Matt yo after this please show us the if there's any mushrooms that you can bring because they're so beautiful or you can leave it as a surprise it's really up to you <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and go on. Right. Great. Here we are. Hey. It works. I'm going to go with this. Slide show it. Oh, cool. Can we see now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so this the, is the, the page. Yeah. So this is the Traveler exhibition here in Toronto. Um, I think if your screens are on the side, if you're, yeah, you might have viewers down the side, but there's a couple with two images in it. This is the installation. You're going to have a different background painting for our new one, um, including another very, like, elab more elaborate environmental sort of painting. So this is a bust. I don't think there are busts being shown in our show, but you've no. got something a lot cooler in your show. Oh, yeah. Um, and these are the paintings. So this is kind of how it began. Uh, this is a diptych called Ancestor 1 and Ancestor 2. And this is kind of a proto-traveler. This is some of the first kind of off-worlders. And they still look brown. They still look like human beings a lot more. Um, and I really like doing this, like, just to step back, you know? And they do, it's, they're reminiscent of these great, uh, empires on planet Earth historically, yeah. a little bit, and and immediately that they can have parts of what we were just talking about. That's like every element of the painting of what's being worn looks like it tells a story and projects a history, and, as well as looking like a future. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's funny how like whole bunch of scraps and parts of the past can like now it looks like a time to come. Yeah. In the background of this piece is a cenotaph to Isaac Newton that was designed by Etienne Boulay, who, is a, who was a Parisian architect. It was never built because it's, it's speculative. It's too crazy. Look at this. Though, all those little things are trees. So if that gives you an <laughs> idea of something that was like probably impossible to build at the time, mathematically or engineering wise. So I just really love to place this uh, very, you know, and intelligent and powerful being in front of something that represents something as yeah. pure, sort of at its essence, pure and well-intentioned as, as science, straight up. Science actually doesn't want to hurt anybody. People take science and try to hurt people. Yeah. Um, these are two uh, it's very similar things, but I think you can see world building happening here. Uh, where there's a painting of a hand holding a, that, that painting is called fuel. And so that's a fuel source. And it's like this strange dark matter that can maybe be put into an engine or a machine of some kind and charge it or give it, you know, fuel. And then the other one is a, is a sculpture called hand with ring. This will be at East side and uh, it's polymer clay and that ring that you see on top is another piece of technology and it's used for pulling the truth out of people who are lying out of liars so it's, <laughs> it's a magical ring that you pull the truth out of someone with and that's cast bronze that's a solid piece of brass i'm sorry um this is light work unfortunately this pendant i just want to show yeah, it's you guys one. this piece this pendant was too crazy to ship, um, but this is, yeah. this is a piece called A Great Ship Came and Went, and I'm referencing the shape of the seed in this, and the seed is something that is, as far as evolution goes, it's perfect. It can house a life for hundreds and thousands of years. It can give birth to it. Something can go to sleep inside it. It can wake from it. So I really love this seed as somebody who loves 
technology that the earth makes by itself, the seed is like, it's the top because without seeds, we're also not, not here, you know, nothing is really here. Anything mammalian, anything that relies on plant life without the seed being as well designed as it is, mm -hmm. we're not even around. So I like giving a salute to nature as much as I possibly can. Nice. And sorry, and this is a brass plated sheet metal. This is a whole bunch of the uh, rings on a cushion. This was for the Toronto show and I just wanted to assemble them as if there were a group of people that, you know, they, they are the custodians, they're the guardians of this particular type of technology and this is where you keep it at the end of the truth making day. <laughs> and that was done right on a plinth actually. I cushioned the plinth itself. Which is yeah, I like the cushion. Yeah. Yeah, I just built it right onto the plinth. Mm. These are pollution wear that you will see uh, coming up in person. Uh, and these are, the one on the left is a fully functional M9 mask dust and particulates mask. You can put it on and go. Uh, the one on the right is actually a elbow pad from a motocross jacket. <laughs> and then there's suede and leather brass beading. All that brass beading that you see there comes from, as other than the planet that you can see on the red, mask it comes from my mom's necklace oh, so wow. one day my daughter was having a tantrum and she tore the necklace my mom's oh. necklace in half in a fit of rage oh. and then all the beads went everywhere i was like all right there it goes you know but it comes together i collected all the parts and i was like it's very beautiful i think it can be beautiful again in another way you know do, do you ever have the masks being worn within exhibitions or yeah yeah being worn by like by, a by people oh. oh i wore i wore the masks for a photo shoot that i did for the art gallery of ontario maybe i'll send that to you yeah that'd be good because like that'd it's be cool i did it in the middle of summer sweating <laughs> in the park that's near my house with my friend kareem our uh, omi thompson who's an incredible photographer so the Art Gallery of Ontario approached me to do a photo essay, like any, they're like, do anything. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll become a traveler. I tried to find someone, but I didn't want to ask anyone in the middle of August in Toronto to wear 25 pounds of clothing and like look, <laughs> try to look nice in a park in nature. So I was like, I'm just going to do this. And I had my friend Tala Kamea, who's an incredible stylist, style me for that and Omi Thompson shoot that. So I was wearing some of the masks in high, in high Park near my house for a photo essay, but no people have been wearing masks. Um, even for your diorama that you're getting, yeah. there's no mat, you can see the face on yeah. the person, but everything else is cloaked. Yeah. Everything else is cloaked. Maybe it's this one time that they've taken it off just for okay. a second and that's the diorama. Nice. It's me working in my studio, making the bust that you saw, that red bust, the first uh -huh. image I'm yeah. making. This is a different studio. Yeah. I tend to change studios every two years or so because it's hard. As, my, as the, the scale of my projects gets bigger, it's hard to find the right space. And I, out of necessity, I'm having to move and move just like the travelers moving. Mm. This is light work that I've done. I can just, share this quickly you yeah, know i want to see light. yeah this is light work so i was making a little some lum luminaries or what have i don't remember really the name for for light work but um do, these are different sketches for for some lights uh that's a light that i made and that's a bent uh sheet metal again that's been coated in in brass and that's an led light and the same studies from before are in the background there you can see mm. them yeah. Uh, this is installed at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery in Oshawa, Ontario. This is me and uh, Kate McNeil putting together the great ship came and went, which I showed you earlier. Yeah. She's an incredible custom light designer. Her company is called Concord Custom Lighting. And we were sharing the same studio. And I just like went in there. I was like, oh, we got to work together, babe, like straight away. And then we started collaborating on on different light fixtures. See, so she's the, the reason that I'm able to make 
that I've if been the able whole, to if the whole world hadn't gone crazy with pandemic and all the after effects and the impacts on travel we would have been able to bring that over but it's just uh, too expensive these days so. yeah and I'm sure Gavin now you have to reconsider at east side what you're bringing from abroad and how that's going yeah. to happen Absolutely. I think my partner about the future of fabricate of future of installation. I think it includes in most cases fabricating on site like completely it does. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, it's quite unusual for us. It's partly the opportunity of the games and the funding that has come along with the games yeah. meant that we could do it. But it still does look you know, it's a lot of resources and a lot of yeah. energy used. Everything's so. different. Everything's different from the time that you were you know the, that budget was probably approved like yeah fuel costs like you, you, anyways <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll chat, I'm sure we're going to chat about this very much in a <laughs> short, short while but yeah that's uh otherwise it would be there maybe in the future there will be an opportunity or I'll make something yeah. if you guys want to commission a light piece from me somewhere in Birmingham let me do that yeah that's something that we can look into. That's that's a good idea. I like that. That's doable. I'll come and do it on site. Okay. Nice. Anyway, moving on. Wow, lots of dreams, lots of things, projects starting already. Uh, these are more sketches for light works. You know, some of these can't be made into real things, and that's a yeah. uh, obstacle I run into making sculpture quite often, where I'll ask if something's possible, and the person who's responsible for that profession tells me no. It is not possible. Here is what's possible. So then changing the design slightly, but I have a hard time letting go of my ideas. But anyway, here they are. You know, you can see what I want to do. I would love for these to just float in the air. Yeah. That's not physics. That's not sound physics. <laughs> uh, here's more sculpture work that I just turned on a lathe in a woodworker studio. I met a woodworker in 2018 doing the first show of the mocha here in toronto and his name is yorgo liapis and he's a very gifted woodworker now you're hearing about all the collaborations that i do i do a lot of collaborations because it nourishes my career and myself um, and my skill set as well yeah. and he had a late late in his studio late right i think that's how you yeah. say it. you yeah. turn wooden leg turn legs so yeah. i started you know, just experimenting on the lathe and making all these different types of conical shapes and rounded domes and things. I really love the cone. Yeah. Uh, cone is a big shape for me. It's and used a lot. A, in they have a connection to the recent clay works that you were making. They do. I mean, yeah, yeah. they're all, I love to build when I'm going, like when I'm going to, I'll go to the clay shapes now. That is, these are, th these are just those shapes up close. Okay. Uh, this is random sculpture that I Ooh. make, but I'm going to go to the clay because just this is what. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was. Yeah. Yeah. And I go to these shapes. Honestly, I think I'm just responding to like reading science textbooks and like looking at astrophysics diagrams, not understanding very much about it when I was young, but really being enchanted by the diagrams themselves and how they talked about very quite a, you know, complex yeah. phenomena, but the shape used to explain it is often a cone. There's cones yeah. all over. Like even the first, some of the first uh, visualizations of wormhole is two cones touching. That's it. Wow. They're like, oh, universe goes in here and it comes out the other side. It's a cone. You know, you know also you know? that the very, the very first flower that, that, that nature ever produced, the first time it made a flower was a cone, the flower cone. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm look it up. I gotta make a note now. It's a, yeah. it's a cycad, a cycad cone. Oh, and, it, and I think I think that's like color. It's like a reddish, a reddish color. Damn, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah, and okay. and that is it's sort of like this first, a first new type of exhibition that plants invented. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they're like, well, we got it. This is the new way we're gonna have sex now. We're yes. gonna we're gonna make these stunning. <laughs> sculpture <laughs> out of our bodies it's incredible yeah. <laughs> but they actually look quite a similar shape to those it's quite fun away and then the red coloration too that red you can see on the second one that in the kiln and this kiln was crazy there's a photo of it later it did fade a little bit i was hoping it will stay like that that's just slip that's clay mixed with dye it's wow. just slip. 
and then you fire the slip and, and that's it's dumped in, down into a burgundy. That was, were they in Columbus scope? That was a question from- They were from installed in Columbus scope. Yeah, cool. So you were making um, them nearby. It wasn't in Colombo where you're making them, was it? Was it? No, I was nearby? making them in Wenapua, which is just north of Nigambo. And that is the west coast of okay. Sri Lanka. Yeah. Uh, west coast is very magical. My favorite is the northeast in Sri Lanka. But the west coast is like a little bit sleepy. There are lots of clay workers there. And, you know, they're not regarded as artisans anymore. They're just regarded as laborers because mostly they undergo now industrial projects such as roof tiling and okay. very basic press mold. Like it's just like press the clay in, turn it out, put it in the kiln, press the clay in. Like it's just very, yeah. there's, you know what? Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan artisanal building methods have on, undergone, su undergone such a tragic like industrialization that I go into the museums back home and I just feel sad. I'm like, oh man, like they stopped making such and such like that. Now yeah. they just make it like they do in, you know, China or Japan because it's- What sort of, what sort of that. time scale has that, has that transformation happened? Is that quite fairly recent or? I'd say that that's probably from the 1970s forward. Yeah, wow. Yeah, because we've started, you know, in the 60s and 70s, we really started trade with India and China. Mm -hmm. uh tr our trade with japan was like long lasting and i think it was 1800s to 1900s because remember sri lanka was a hub we're right. actually so mixed in our mm -hmm. genealogy when people look into it they're like oh why is this it's like look into history sri lanka has names by arab nations it has a name in japan it has a name in china it has a name in india it has mm -hmm. it so we have our own name east africans had a name for us so it's just like we were, it was a hub, right? So it was really like a huge mix and a mingle before we were uh, colonized three times by the, the Portuguese, the Dutch, and then the British. So then the British came through and did a ethnic cleanse and declared Singhalese people and culture to be more. Uh, yeah, it should be, it should homogenize into that for it to retain, you know, national strength and so yeah. on and so forth. So, so um, yeah, those are kind of the timelines for that. And when you go into the museums back home, you can see how, you know, a rice cooker used to be made and it's, you just can't find it. And it used to be a beautiful thing with legs so that it would spread the heat evenly and it wouldn't burn the bottom. And then, but it's still really fluffy and it tastes good from the clay. You can't now find it, it's, yeah. it's over. And you'll ask them to make it. They're like, I don't make those. My grandpa used to make them, but I don't know how to make that. It's like, oh no. So there's stuff that has been lost. But this gentleman you can see uh, with his, together with his family and his team on the left is uh, Sarat Chandrajiva. And I didn't know anything about this man, but I feel really lucky to be mentored by him for this project because he is like his own work he's incredible and he's prolific and he's a really he teaches clay he was a university professor in sri lanka for i think about a decade before that an artist for his whole life mostly in clay and ceramics and stoneware and that's his studio in his house and all around it and it's stunning all around it are installations of his own work from different time periods so it'll be his work from like the 60s 70s his wow. work in the 80s is so cool it's like really futuristic but he doesn't know he's like oh i was kind of thinking about you know vedic astrology i'm like dude this is like it's so crazy <laughs> very very uh precise and sharp and like symmetrical so it's like sci-fi lover's dream you know some of his yeah. work so anyway i didn't know anything about it before i was basically hooked up with this guy by colombo scope uh hmm. and the, and the organizers there so we made works, uh, different types of work that I kind of designed just before I left here, before I left Toronto. And the shapes have not really changed. They stayed very true to, true to form on what I wanted to do. The only thing that's changed about this piece, and I'm pointing to the fish mouth looking one. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. That was supposed designed to be closed. Oh. We designed it to be open so that it would, because of our drawing time was short. I had to do this quickly. So we needed things. We need to build vents in the things and put them in the wind and the sun 
very mm. specifically. Clay is so hard. It's so temperamental to work with, but it, there's nothing like it. It's uh, just beautiful. The way you feel making it is like, that's a different thing, right? Yeah, they look incredible. This is the crazy kiln. He oh, built it wow. into his house. That's his granddaughter in the polka dots helping, <laughs> helping to load the kiln. And it's like, you know, it's pretty dangerous. <laughs> but she's just like, I'm, I'm going to help. I want to help. It's like, okay, go ahead. Just don't get like a brick landed on your leg, on your foot, you know? So she was very sweet. Um, the guy who was in their loading has been a longtime student of Sarat's. Uh, and these are the works. So we fired them and that was a, you know, a gut-wrenching experience. We spent a week and three days building all these objects and now we don't really know if there's, oh. there's no, we haven't had a lot of time to dry it. We don't know about their structural integrity in the kiln. We don't know anything. And luckily there was only two cracks in all of the work that wow. came up. At yeah. the end of the, when we were loading the kiln and before we start the firing, we do a ritual, we hang a coconut. So that's a blessing for the kiln and for firing. When the firing is over, before you unload the kiln, you take the coconut and you break it on the ground. Then you can share the pieces and eat them or feed them to crows, which is also great, really good luck. Um, so, so there are little rituals around clay making as well back home, which I learned that was yeah, really nice. cool. Um, yeah, really the cool. works installed in front of the Colombo Public Library. So we had these grounds. I chose this really crazy tree. You can't see the tree here, which I'm realizing, shoot. That tree that's in the background, you can see on oh, the yeah. left side here that it's all gnarled and it's going like this. It's actually yeah. such a perfect tree to hang some ceramics. And there were lots of interactions with these objects by birds and different animals. Great. Uh, this is a lantern that I built in Sri Lanka in Colombo during Colombo Scope as well. So I had a two double project for <laughs> both installations there. I'm telling you, Gavin, it's the future <laughs> of installations we just got to show up and make it there with yeah the i like the new approach yeah and this is a kite maker um and i met we met him in a marketplace looking for a kite maker sri lanka has a long long history and tradition of kite making and lantern making wow. so he does this professionally i came in with a sketch i wanted to do the nc 1701 which is one of the star trek enterprise vessels yeah. and he he did. I went with a sketch and I could see that the way his mind was wiggling, it was going in another way. And I didn't really want to stop it. I was like, OK, you go because he was going to build, help me build the frame. We're going to build the frame together. He starts coming up with geometry. You can see on the left side on the ground, this crazy yeah. shape that is just done with like more raw bamboo sticks so they're younger they're supple they're not old so you have to split it and then you bend it to prepare and then you st wedge older sticks in between to make the gaps and to create this geometry so it's really based on a lot of like lotus flowers and floral we're talking about flowers again floral types of geometry and it's really simple Trying to go to the next slide. After this, it makes me hit the thing. So you can see he's moving through. Now he's like putting together the engine and the thrusters and connecting them. And then on the right, on the right side is my friend Firi Rahman, who's an incredible artist back home, uh, starting to put the papers down over the lantern. And that's us trying to come up with some solutions for probably some kind of technical problem. <laughs> um, this is there's just a few more, and then it's done. This is him with this is him in the library. This, this is the newspaper room in the library. It's my favorite room. It's so beautiful. I really <laughs> like it. Oh, it doesn't go to the next one. Okay, that's um, close-ups of the detailing using marble paper. That marble paper, Gavin, was made mm. in Colombo by a woman who makes marble paper only to sell to grocery stores. Wow. Yeah, we had a heck of a time wow. trying to track her down and when we find her I was like oh can I get custom sheets I want these colors I have budget look she's like oh no no I'm too busy in production for for keels what does she why how do the supermarket use her marbling I do not that's where they're sold <laughs> I don't get it I'm like this is stunning work like you could sell this 
this can be imported to all parts of the world. People, artists can really, we love this. She's like, no, no, I'm too busy. I'm too tired. <laughs> <laughs> she just, she just like, makes her art and that's it. She doesn't need Yeah, anything. that's it. She does her thing. She's out. She's got her family. She's got her kids. She has time for all this ambition, <laughs> ambitious stuff. And that's us in another room, finishing it off. Sorry. I'm having trouble doing that. It was this was that a, was that a separate that, that was a, a different show? It wasn't part yeah, of no, the the same. That's the same library. It's a different room now. We had to move uh, out of the newspaper room, get it ready in another one to ship to the site. If you go yeah. on my Instagram, you can see a video of it kind of with the ten with its tendrils in the wind, kind of flying. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. know why I don't have that video here. I'm yeah. sorry. You can, but it's, oh. you can see it on my Instagram. It's there. And now this is Horse and Riders. So this is what we've been doing in the studio for a yeah. long time. Emily has been shaving cow hair for a month straight, shaving and shaving because we are using hair transfer techniques that are typically used for uh, animatronics in movies and television. Oh, wow. So lots of research weird independent YouTube research. So that's the pieces of the horse coming into the studio. And this is a taxidermy form. So this is a form that now the way they do taxidermy on large animals is you buy an in foam injected form and then you stretch an entire hide over it. As a result, there's all these like extra articulation on this sculpture, on this animal, this form that we didn't need. So sanding that down and getting rid of, you know, it had these pecs and like, big arteries and veins because it has to show through a high right so we're not we didn't do that we had to get rid of those things in fact there's you know a, not that much modification but a good amount that's my technician Harmon Harmon on the left side who's holding the head on the horse with the rider and then on the right side you can see some different research for flocking electrostatic flocking which we're using as a gear transfer technique as well hmm. that's the horse and rider in the studio so that's me and Emily uh, starting to color the bottom of the body and shape the hooves and things like that. Because again, this is a stand, very standard horse shaped horse form. It's not specific. And I did want kind of smaller, thinner hooves that were sharper and things like that. So we had to go in and make those different mods. Uh, this is uh, an eyeball that I made on the left side. Uh, and it's a, you can see that it's quite a heavily distorted kind of retina and cornea. Uh, closer to something that would be on a goat or another kind of prairie grazing animal. I don't know if you know, but goat eye, eyeballs and, and uh, pupils look like that because it helps them see the horizon wider in case there's a predator coming from wider out. Mm -hmm. It lets them see the whole horizon so they don't miss a beat. So they have less of a chance of being eaten. So I kind of modeled it after a goat eye because they're just where they are so cool yeah. uh, on the on the right you can see i'm now uh cutting more eye holes into the face of the horse and changing because we yeah. need a we need a mutated organism here not a standard you're, one. you're calling this a post horse yeah it's a post horse it's horses after horses yeah as we know them so oh, later on the horses. So on the on the left side you can see that after that a lot of hair transfer so um, the way we did that is taking hair off of a cow hide that was available from ikea and then sticking tape on there and then you shave off the back you apply a prosthetic glue and a spray to the other side and then you have a workable skin of hair so very carefully applying that to the body of the animal yeah it looks amazing yeah, so that's that's what I've got on the. I don't want to share anymore because no, that's I'm enough. Yeah, realizing as I'm sharing this, I'm like, oh, I don't want too much. I don't want them to see very much. But right now, Emily's here, you know, with some moss that is going to go in the habitat. She's beating a pair of gloves. Uh, we're going to change that jacket that's over there. Do you want to show the glove? Sure. Let's show the glove. Oh, no, this, this, our, our, view of, our view of you is really small, Rajni. We can only just we can only see it. We can't see oh, much detail. We need, oh, we, we no, need I'm going to drop the screen share. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Drop share. Let's have a now look. Now, am I large? Am I large now? Yeah, you're big. You're big again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where we're now uh, ornamenting a pair of dinner gloves that Very I found. Cool. So it's going to be beaded. 
Um, there's other clothes that are in the shipment. We have, a, we have different mosses. You can show the jacket and the fur. Thank you. This is the jacket with green fur on it. That <laughs> Traveler is gonna be wearing that, but we're gonna change it a little more. This is different mosses and things. Matt, if you're watching that we're gonna incorporate. So these are treated. I'm just gonna pack them in my suitcase. We'll see how it goes. Um, and then there's, but there are fake things. Like we've got like fake, you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, fake okay. lens. Yeah. Yeah. Fake, yeah. real, spray painted, unpainted, and we're gonna mix it up. And then we've got Matthew Gale's stunning fungal distortions and or um, improvisations. Yeah, so that, that was a really nice thing. When you were over on your visit and you were saying, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love it if there's somebody in Birmingham who makes almost like future plants and like a bit of habitat that we could have around the horse and rider. And, and it just so happens that, the, that Matt Gale is such an artist here in Birmingham. And it was great that you two got on. And yeah. so Matt, you've been, you've, I, I don't know exactly what you've asked Matt to do. I only know bits of it, not even the full. It's, the, yeah, the, I asked Matt, I kind of told Matt what I wanted to do on the ground. And I was just like, do your thing. <laughs> Your things. Uh, uh, I have like a few. I don't even remember what specifications there were. They need to be inserted into the floral foam that we're using to construct the body of this ground, right? That it happens in these little slopes and tiny little hills that we're gonna like dress. I think pretty meticulously at the end. But now, how's, it, how's but, it going, Matt? Yeah. It it's going. It's, it's going really well. It's funny you were talking about skinning the horse, and I've been kind of. So I've been creating basically a fungal leather and I've been skinning one of the pieces today and I'll kind of do a sneak peek so you can't really see much of it, but uh, okay. hold on. So, it's like so that's fungal leather. Fungal the, orange, leather. the orange bits on the side, wow. Yeah. Those are real fungi, so a different species and I've basically just created this hybrid amazing yeah yeah that's, that's so it, it's so interesting how that sits that that makes sense sitting in that world in relation to, to guess Rashi, what to guess what world. matt look at this color of moss it's like exactly the color <laughs> of what you've done Perfect. you're good you see that all you have to do is save someone's life once from a river and then you have a connection forever <laughs> <laughs> I completely forgot that. <laughs> so we we're having such a good time that we've used yeah. up we've used up the whole hour, and I've just realised. Well, so some people are having to leave. So I don't, but I don't. But I think if anyone's got any quick other questions, because um, then now is the time to jump in before we all have to leave. I suppose. So sorry about that. Not we wanted to give more time for questions, but there's just. Hey, it's fine. Leaving. I'm still here. Rue's here. Hi, Rue. Rue. Oh, <laughs> when are you coming <laughs> uh, may 15th i'll be there 16th, may we'll 15th. Be there. okay um this is a question for 16th gavin and Regine. gavin i'm just gonna come there every day and come and hang is that cool <laughs> i'll help i'll do work <laughs> there's, we'll be able to find there's always things to do Rue. so i think that's, I'll, that's cool i'll keep occupied i just want to be immersed in your world Rajni. it's amazing can help. why don't you help you can help put the habitat together well, anyway we'll come up with like things we can do together there will be yeah. more than enough work for the installation like <laughs> so, so amazing. We'll something out Rue. but yeah of course love to see you there <laughs> Um, anyone, anyone else want to want to jump in for a quick question or anything at all? Yeah, I'm just skipping through, seeing if there's anything there. Are there any questions in the chat? Um, no, just people saying. Just people saying they enjoyed themselves. So that was good. And there was Rue asking about Columbus Go. But I hope, hopefully, that's given everyone. I think it was a really great insight because it's nice to connect up all those different things and you're right you know I've seen some bits on Instagram and and I know other works but I think it's really useful for people to see the range and the collaborations and the different approaches and yeah. the sense of how to how you make things yeah been really those useful. collaborations keep me really happy they give me lots of inspiration and energy to like make other work later and 
also then I have a friend at the end of it too. So that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, really good. I love all of that. Anyone well. who wants to be friends with me is like a saint, you know. <laughs> Bless them. God. <laughs> You're going to have lots of friends here in Birmingham. So that's I it. already already you guys are like <laughs> Um, yeah, that's the, that's the thing. Jazz is saying that we haven't got the time now to delve into post-colonial life right now. I think yeah, it could be that's, right, Jazz. Yeah, I mean, I have yeah. talks there, right? So there's a talk on the 4th of June. Yes. So yeah, yeah, that's it. Ask the so, question there. Yeah, we'll so we're going to we're gonna launch the... So Rajni's mural, it will be painted on the River Ray. We'll launch earlier on the, on the af late afternoon, early evening on the 3rd of June, and then we'll come over to Eastside Projects to launch the exhibition. And we'll also be launching works by Amy Lam on, on that night, on June the 3rd too. But on the next, the following day, we'll do a From the Artist's Mouth, walk around, in the show, hear more, get up close. So um, we can do, we'll do that in the flesh, you can come to the gallery, and we'll also do it on Instagram Live. So we'll, we'll keep both options for people who want to access the works. Um, Insta Live is kind of great, not gonna lie. Yeah. I feel like Instagram can work on their sound quality. Yeah, we've a got a more. little we've got a little microphone that we can connect to it okay. to kind of make it a I bit have better. Good help yeah. On that. yeah, yeah, but Insta Live is great because everyone can just all they're yeah. on there anyway. Yeah. Just click on it. And then the exhibition is gonna run from June the third to I think it's August the seventh, which is pretty much the last but one day of the Commonwealth Games. So it is set across that whole period of the run up to and including the games themselves in Birmingham. And yeah. we're hoping that um, we will be able to make a lot of noise through the power of the artists who are here. And this sort of, and in a way, a very anti-colonial artist grouping to come in and to talk, uh, yeah, truth to power about, it, about what, what's the reality of Birmingham and the UK and the Commonwealth Games. Yeah. So. Thank you so much, Rajni. That was really great whirlwind tour. Yeah, thanks for having me. Brilliant. All right, and we'll see That's you, fun. see everyone else again soon at the next event. All right, thanks for coming. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>